The Sony a7 III and the Tamron 70-28 are a great combo for astrophotography, but there's a few tips and tricks that you're going to want to know if you're going to go shoot the stars with this combo, and I'm going to break down the positives and the negatives of this lens, specifically when it comes to shooting astrophotography. Hey, my name is Jake Sloan. I create content here for solo creators on the go, people who are mobile, creating by themselves, and so I do reviews of equipment that makes the process easier, and I do tips and tutorials on how to improve your videography and your photography so that you can tell better stories. One of the things I was really excited about with the Tamron 17 and 28 was having kind of an all-in-one wide-angle zoom lens that could also shoot astrophotography as well as do great video, which the Tamron does do excellent video. Almost all of my videos have been filmed with this camera and this lens since it came out because it's just such a fantastic combination for anybody who's filming stuff. And especially if you're filming tutorial type things of yourself, then this is a great combination. But shooting astrophotography is very, very different because not only are you dealing with extremely low light conditions, but in my case, when I shoot astrophotography, it's also extremely cold. So let's go out and shoot a few photos and maybe a little bit of video and see what we can come up with. And then we'll break down the positives, the negatives of this lens for astrophotography. And I'll give you some of the tips and tricks that I've learned on how to set this thing up and how to use it when you're shooting in pitch black conditions at night in the cold. All right, we're up here at Hatcher's Pass. Got the uh, Tamron 7028, which is what I'm filming this on right now on the a7 III. I'm also gonna film a time-lapse with the Sigma 16 on my a6600. It's a little windy, it's pretty cold. We'll see how long I last, but we're gonna do some astrophotography and some star time-lapses. Put the gloves on and get moving so we can get warm. It's just a, it's just a quick one mile run up this snow covered mountainside to get to the mine, no big deal. We are sitting on, or standing on top of like, what, eight feet of snow, maybe 10 feet of snow? There's a, there's a bit. It's a lot, a lot of snow. Anyway, but we're here. So we're gonna set up the time lapse facing this way into that spot of darkness and then we're going to take photos facing that way into that spot of darkness you're going to do two things time lapse astrophotography and i'm using the loom cube 2.0 uh we're going to do some light painting on these old buildings too um you know unless we freeze to death in which case Whoever finds this camera, please post it on my YouTube channel. Thanks. So we've done three test shots because it took a bit to get the right focus with the Sigma lens, but we got it now. Um, got the exposure, everything's pretty well set where I want it. So we're gonna just start the time-lapse here and go for like 600, 700 shots. It's really cool. We're gonna call it here. I'm gonna do the rest of this in the studio, um, but there are some definite tips and tricks that you're gonna wanna see about using the Tamron lens for astrophotography. It was extremely cold. It was about 15 degrees and there was about a 15 or 20 mile an hour wind blowing. And so that put the wind chill factor into well below zero range. Uh, so we cut our trip short. Plus there were some clouds kind of coming in. You'll see some of them in some of the photos that I'm gonna show you. However, it was a great trip and I'm really happy with a few of the images that we got out of it. So first let's talk about the positives because there are quite a few when it comes to this particular lens. One, it is very sharp, even at f2.8 and zoomed all the way out at 17 millimeters. The center is extremely sharp. The corners are really, really sharp. And I was surprised at how well it performed in extremely low light conditions. And I mean, very low light conditions. So having a really nice sharp lens is of course crucial when you're shooting stars because stars are tiny pinpoints of light and the sharper your lens is, the, the better that they're gonna come through. This lens does great because it does have a, a constant aperture at f2.8. Now I did notice that the lens performs the best at 22 to 24 millimeters as far as there's the least amount of distortion. It definitely is the sharpest there. And if you can uh, stop it down to like, right around f4 or so it definitely sharpens everything up but i didn't really have a problem with shooting everything at f2.8 i was really happy with the results and one thing that i was surprised about is once i figured out where the infinity focus is on the lens it i was able to hit it every single time even though it's not an actual manual focus um, it was really nice to put the camera in focus and to know that i could go right to where infinity focus is and hit it and nail it every single time. And now let's talk about some of the negatives because there are a few and they're not really huge deal breakers. And once you learn a few of the tips and tricks, they're easy to overcome. But one is 
the manual focus because it's a it's there's no stops or anything like that because it's a focus by wire system you kind of have to figure out where exactly the focus is and it's difficult to do when it's dark you can't preset a manual focus during the day and then have the lens be still there at night like you can with a manual lens but again once you find it, it's easy to find and repeat every single time, which I was kind of surprised about. There is a little bit of vignetting at 17 millimeters, but it goes away pretty quick when you get to 20 or so, and it's easy to correct that in post. The other downside for me is that depending on where you have foreground elements, and I think astrophotography is great, especially when you have foreground elements, but depending on what those foreground elements are and where they are in the frame, you'll notice a fair amount of distortion, especially when it's really open at 17 degrees, just because it stretches the edges of that image out. And so like in this case, when you have people standing in the frame, you can tell they look a little different or the building here, the lines are a little off and it's a little bit distorted. Again, some of that you can correct in post or you can correct by just zooming in or also being aware of how you're framing things up when you shoot astrophotography. If you've never shot astrophotography before, it does take some practice and I have gone out quite a few times and failed miserably at getting any sort of usable photos. But once you learn a few of the tricks and once you f learn a few of the techniques, it makes it actually fairly easy to get pretty good, pretty consistent photos. The first trick is I always set the aperture at 2.8. I found that the sharpness is plenty for astrophotography at 2.8. You could stop it down to f4, but then you're gonna be bumping your ISO up quite a bit. And I prefer to keep my ISO as low as I possibly can to keep it as clean an image as I possibly can. And this next tip is the most important thing you can use when you're shooting astrophotography is figuring out what the maximum length of the exposure time you can use is before the stars start to blur. Now, if you want to do star trails, that's certainly an option. I know that's popular for meteor showers and things like that, but if you want really sharp looking stars, then you need to figure out exactly how long you can have it before the Earth's rotation starts to blur the stars before you start to see star streaks and star trails and stuff like that. The easiest way to figure that out is you take the number 500 and divide it by the focal length you're using. So if you do 500 divided by 17, you end up with about 29 seconds. If you do 500 divided by 24 millimeters, then you end up with about 20 seconds. And so that is the maximum length you can have your shutter open for exposure time to be able to get sharp stars. Now that's your starting point, but then play around with it a little bit. You'll shoot a few test images to find your framing first and then to make sure your focus is good and then to make sure your shutter speed is where you want it for your exposure time. And then the next step is making sure you get the ISO, which again is gonna be shooting a few test shots till you kind of figure out where you wanna be. For most of these photos, I was at an ISO of a thousand for a couple of them, for 1200, 1600 for a few of them, and a 3200 for most of them. And again, that comes into just kind of playing around with that in your few test shots once you find your framing and your exposure time, and then play around with your ISO to figure out exactly where you want it and how you want to expose the shot. And then the last thing is, because you should shoot in RAW, because that gives you the most amount of flexibility in the end for editing these photos, I set my white balance at 5,500 and leave it there because that gives me the most amount of flexibility in the end to be able to adjust the white balances across all of the images I've taken and have a consistent look. For some tips and tricks, one, you're gonna wanna use a tripod, of course, because you're gonna be doing very long exposures and you wanna make sure the tripod you're using is fairly stable and fairly substantial. One trick that you wanna do when you're taking photos is set your drive mode to have a two or five second delay from when the time you push the shutter button to the time the exposure actually begins. You want a couple seconds delay so that you can push the button back away from the camera and the tripod and and it will be still by the time it actually starts to take the exposure. That will help you a lot. And that was one thing that I didn't do early on. And I really missed a lot of images because of that, because the camera was moving when it first started the photo. And then you want to set this to have it in the manual focus mode and find infinity focus. Now, the cool thing that I figured out with the Tamron lens, and it has worked for me every single time, is when you have it in manual focus and you start to move the focus ring, you can see that the meters are changing, especially if you're way over here, and it gives you kind of an, an idea of the distance. The closer you get to the far side, when it goes from you know 25 millimeters or whatever it shows you to that infinity symbol there, that is exactly where you wanna stop. If you go further than that, 
then the pictures will actually be out of focus. But if you stop right when it changes from an actual measurement to the infinity symbol, that is pretty much as close to dead on at infinity focus as I've been able to find. If you're interested in buying the Tamron 1728, there's a link in the description. It's an affiliate link, so it will give me a small commission at no extra expense to you, and it does help me do what I do. You can also check out my Patreon if you wanna see more behind the scenes stuff of the things that I do on this channel. You'll see lots of behind the scenes footage from things that don't make it into these particular videos. There's also a link in the description for some of the raw files from the images that you've seen in this video, so that you can download them, play around with them yourself, and see what you think. If you wanna learn more about other lenses that I use on a regular basis, you can click or tap right here. I'll see you in one of those videos. As always, if you got questions, ask them in the comments below, and I'll do my best to answer them.